Good evening, virtual audience, and welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight from wherever in the world you are located. My name is Kate Bruns, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I am so pleased to introduce this event with Christoph Koch, discussing his latest book, The Feeling of Life Itself, Why Consciousness is Widespread but Can't Be Computed. Joined in conversation tonight by Gabriel Kramen. Tonight's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science-related literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. Coming up in the series on October 20th, we will virtually welcome James Fleming for a discussion of his new book, First Woman, Joanne Simpson and the Tropical Atmosphere. And then on November 10th, we will host cosmologist John Eleven for her latest book, Black Hole Survival Guide. To learn more about this and our other upcoming events, you can sign up for the bookstore's email newsletter at harvard.com or check out the page harvard.com slash science for more info. We also have a science research public lecture series YouTube page where you can see any previous talks that you might have missed. This evening's event is going to conclude with some time for your questions. If you would like to ask Christoph and Gabriel something, please go to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen where you can submit a question. We're going to get through as many as time allows for this evening. Also, once the event begins, I'm going to post a link in the chat to purchase tonight's featured book, The Feeling of Life Itself. All sales through this link support Harvard Bookstore. So a huge thank you for your support. Your purchases and your financial contributions, there will also be a donate link in the chat. Make this virtual author series possible and now more than ever support the future of a landmark indie bookstore. So thank you so much to our partners at Harvard University, and thank you to all of you for tuning in and showing up for authors, publishers, indie book selling, and especially for science, because it really matters. And finally, as you might have experienced in virtual gatherings the last few months, technical issues can arise, and if they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly. So thank you for your patience and your understanding. And now I am so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Physicist turned neurobiologist Christoph Koch is the chief scientist and president of the MindScope program at the Allen Institute in Seattle. Best known for his studies exploring the brain basis of consciousness, he's now leading a 10 year large scale effort to build brain observatories for mapping, analyzing and understanding the mouse and human cerebral cortex. Prior to the Allen Institute, he was a professor of biology for 27 years at the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena. Christoph's also the author of two technical textbooks and a previous book, Consciousness, Confessions of a Romantic Reductionist. He's joined on screen tonight by Harvard Medical School and Children's Hospital professor, Gabriel Kramen. He leads the executive function and memory module in the Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines and his lab studies the neuronal circuits and mechanisms underlying perception and cognition. Tonight, the two will be discussing Christoph's latest book, The Feeling of Life Itself, just released in paperback this last month and hailed as thorough, witty, and compelling. Nature calls it invigorating. Koch tracks the neural footprints of experience, swims off the wilder shores of integrated information theory, and speculates about the feeling of life itself in ravens, bees, and octopuses. We are so excited to welcome them to your screens tonight. So without further ado, the digital podium is yours, Gabriel and Christoph. It's so amazing. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> All right, the podium is yours, the two of you. I'm signing off. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Kate, again. Thanks everybody for, for your patience. I apologize for the technical uh, glitches. So Christoph, um, uh, it's good to have you back. Uh, why don't we start by you telling us uh, uh, what the feeling of life itself uh, is about? So here's a book in its paperback edition. The, feeling of, the book, The Feeling of Life Itself, is about the feeling of life itself, what I describe every experience. By consciousness, we mean, many of us mean any experience, the way it feels like to be alive, to be sad, to be distraught over the state of the world, those are all different conscious states. And um, over the last uh, 50 years, 
there's been a concerted effort to look at the, the physical basis of that called the neuronal correlates of consciousness to track the footprints of consciousness in the brain of humans and closely related species. It helped determine uh, who is conscious, who is not conscious, uh, and, to, and to understand the pathologies of consciousness and disorders of consciousness like vegetative states, coma, uh, behavioral unresponsive uh, states. But then there's also the question, how far does consciousness go? Who else has it? And how, how, uh, how do we know? Um, and then, of course, there's a question that's confronting us today. Computers that we build ourselves, they are becoming increasingly more intelligent. And what is the relationship between their, their behavior, intelligent or not, and their ability to feel? Can they do they feel, can they ever feel now or in, in the future? And to answer all those questions, finally, we need a theory. We need a fundamental, rigorous, empirical, accessible theory that tells us sort of from first principle, first in ourselves, it has to be tested in ourselves, because only we are sure, only ultimately I know that I'm conscious. But then in, in closely related cases like you and, and my friends and, and, and other humans and ultimately in, in animals that tells us who is conscious, who's not conscious and where in particular, where does this, this consciousness, this feeling, this, this strange feeling, this, this, this buzz in the head, the, the voice in my head, the, the image in my, the movie in the, that, that makes up my life, where this comes from and how does it fit into the picture uh, of the universe that science has given us. So that's what this, uh, this book is about, particularly with respect to this one theory called integrated uh, information theory. That's one of the two sort of promising candidates of scientific theories of consciousness that people are pursuing today in the lab. Can you, uh, can you provide a brief summary of, uh, of, of the theory of uh, integrated information theory? <clears throat> yeah, so IIT, integrated information theory, IIT sort of takes a, an axiomatic fundamental approach. It says, well, consciousness ultimately is something intrinsic to the system and exists for itself, right? Only I know that I'm conscious and I may not be able to move. I might be paralyzed. I might be in a sleep in a state where I'm, uh, where I'm asleep and my muscles are, are paralyzed, yet I have conscious experiences, I, I dream. So ultimately consciousness is for itself, it's definite, it's, it's highly informative, it's integrated, and, it's, uh, and every experience is one, it's a definite experience. There are certain things that are in my experience and there are certain things that are not part of my experience. And then from these sort of five axioms of what every uh, of every conscious experience has to obey these five axioms, it then derives postulates about a physical mechanism. So it looks at the physical mechanism, a bunch of neurons or transistors or any other physical state, and then asks, well, what is it about this, this thing that it has to have in order to be conscious? And the theory ultimately says, ultimately what consciousness is, is sort of intrinsic causal power. It's a the way the system is influenced by its past and the way the system determines is pregnant in the words of, of Leibniz is it is pregnant with its own future to what extent the, the the system determines its own future and any system that has a lot of intrinsic causal power something that you can measure you can look at the system you can describe its states if you know how to go from one state to the other and you know that exhaustively for all states you can then in principle determine the full intrinsic causal power of the system. And the theory says, ultimately, that's what consciousness is. And any one conscious experience, for instance, a conscious experience of ex spatial extended extendedness has to be explainable out of this intrinsic causal power. And so a certain system, it, it, it measures the, the causal power system has. It, this is a number called phi that some of you may have heard. It's a number that's either zero then the system isn't conscious. The system has no causal power upon itself. The system, strictly speaking, doesn't exist for itself because it can be explained as an as a independent sum of individual components. So therefore, it doesn't exist as a system. But any system that exists for itself has a number phi that's bigger than zero. And the bigger the, the, the number phi, the more conscious the system is. So in principle, the theory gives rise to this measure of consciousness that you can apply to babies and to fetuses and to 
uh, normal adults and to you know stroke victims and to cats and mice and dogs and worms and in principle you, you can sort of take this phi meter and and measure the amount of intrinsic causal power the system has thereby how conscious that particular system is in a particular state so th this sounds uh, really fascinating and to me one of the most uh, counterintuitive aspects of this theory is, is exactly what you were just alluding to this uh, phi meter um, the notion that we, we might be able to, to measure phi in, in, all kinds of, uh, uh, in all kinds of things, uh, from flies to bacteria, to chairs and tables and computers. S some of these may have a very low phi, but a non-zero phi. So how do you reconcile or how, how do you think about the notion that, that bacteria may have a low degree of phi or that um, uh, my iPhone may have a low uh, phi value? Um, um, and what, what does this number, um, what, what does having a higher phi value or a lower value mean? Well, so it means to what extent is the system irreducible? Um, and, I mean, ultimately it's one number, it doesn't quantify, it, it doesn't sort of describe the qualitative aspect of the particular conscious state that the, the, the brain is in. So let's say my phi might be 6.8 times 10 to the 25. That's a high number, but it doesn't tell you, am I you know, conscious of pain or red or of the state of the affair, right? So for that, you have to read out the individual component of the system. But it tells you at least this is a system that's highly integrated, highly differentiated, and, and therefore has this intrinsic causal power is conscious. And it violates, because as you said, it may be true that even simple system like flies, like worms, the worm C. elegans that studied widely in the lab, or maybe even individual bacteria may have, because they're so vastly complex. Today, we cannot even on a supercomputer model all the molecular interaction within a single cell. So it may well be that even this itsy bitsy tiny cell has some measure of phi that's different from zero. So that violates our intuition because we think, well, only you and I, and maybe cats and dogs and great apes, uh, you know, and elephants and other charismatic megafauna are conscious. But of course, here I'm not talking about high degree of consciousness. We're not talking about mental content like you and I, right? If I, if it's true that a bacteria has a phi, let's say of 25 for the sake of argument, or 42, it's a nicer number, 42, right? That doesn't mean the bacteria has thoughts about tomorrow or has regrets or feels fat or feels, you know, you know, it it it, it just may feel like something. And when it's dead, when it's dissolved into its component, it doesn't feel like anything. So it may be, a, it, it, it will be a very primitive form, but it may well be that this feeling, again, of life itself may persist even in, in a simple organism that most people assume for heaven's sake, they can't be conscious. Just like, you know, many other measures in the universe, like temperature, we know uh, out in outer space, there's actually temperature different from absolute zero, right? It's 4.2 degrees, it's a background radiation. It's incredible cold in outer space, yet physics and measurements tell us there's still a minimum amount of molecular motion that can be measured as, um, as temperature in deep space. And so it may be with this measure phi. And this is, of course, a very ancient philosophical belief. Some of the greatest thinkers in the West, Plato, Schopenhauer, uh, Russell, Leibniz, you know, one of the fathers of, of, of computers and, and, and um, integral calculus, all thought that consciousness is far more widespread than we, than we are led to believe. Christoph, uh, this is fascinating. Before we continue, I want to do a quick experiment. Some people are complaining about the sound quality. Can, can we turn off our, uh, the video and see if that, that works better? Um, and if somebody uh, uh, on the Q&A can, uh, can tell us whether the sound is better now, uh, I would appreciate it. And um, so um, one, one aspect that, that's fascinating that you touch upon in the book is uh, this, uh, the connection between consciousness uh, and intelligence or the lack of connection uh, between the two. Um, there, there are many movies uh, out there about um, the idea that we may have uh, sentient uh, machines. You even wrote a beautiful article about uh, uh, the movie Ex Machina. Uh, you have argued quite vehemently that intelligence and consciousness are quite different things. So can, can you expand on that? Intelligence ultimately is a measure of behavior. It's, if, I'm, you know, if I'm confronted with some particular new environment, how quickly do you adapt to it over immediate or over short term, or over the long term, right? 
so that ultimately is intelligence, the way to rapidly adapt, modulate my behavior appropriate to the circumstance. That's all behavior. That, is, that doesn't say anything about feeling. That doesn't say anything about experience. So conceptually, intelligence and experience are really very different things. Now in humans, or maybe in all evolved creatures such as uh, you know, other animals, intelligence and consciousness may well correlate. In fact, in our brain, they may well co-mingle, but conceptually they're different. And you can certainly imagine a supercomputer that is as intelligent as us, or that even, uh, you know, superhuman artificial general intelligence, but that has no feeling whatsoever. Conversely, you can easily imagine brain organoids that, you can that we can now engineer in, or at least in 10 or 20 years in large sort of carpets of cortical, up, you know, engineered from, from human induced pluripotent stem cells that give rise to a large carpet of, of cerebral organoids that have high consciousness yet no behavior because they have no output effectors. They're, so you can certainly, the, the way I think about them, it's a plane and on the x-axis, you plot the intelligence of that individual or of that species. And on the y-axis, you plot the, the, the measure of consciousness that the species or the individual of that species has. And in principle, they, these are independent things. In fact, so integrated information theory predicts that digital computers of the sort for Neumann machine we have today have, have lit very small intrinsic causal power. And although, although in their aggregate, they can simulate the human brain or they can in principle simulate intelligent behavior, and they probably will do that soon in the future, it doesn't feel like anything to be such a digital simulation, even of a, even of a, um, of a human brain. Just like you can simulate the causal power of gravity, for example, of the, 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 the black hole at the center of our galaxy, right? Sagittarius A star, you know, the Nobel prizes were given out for that last week. Um, we, can, we can write a computer program that simulates the power of the black hole to attract everything to it, so nothing can escape, not even light, that's the name. But funny, we don't have to be concerned that the, computer that the computer programmer himself or herself will be sucked into the computer simulation. Why not? Well, that's a difference between, between the real and the simulated. The simulated doesn't have the causal power of the real. And because it doesn't have the causal power, you won't get the, the gravitational singularity. Likewise, you can, be, you can simulate behavior, but you will not get the consciousness associated with the behavior unless you replicate the human brain in particular hardware. Christoph, I'm, uh, I'm told here that you can turn on the video uh, again. Uh, th thanks a lot. Um, so uh, despite this dissociation, um, in your, in your book, you also argue that um, in principle, there is no physical limit uh, to, to consciousness in the sense that uh, we might in principle, with a different type of hardware, and, and you um, alluded to neuromorphic engineering, for example, we might be able to build devices that, that would have a, a hi-fi. That's correct. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing supernatural about the human brain. It doesn't have extra magical properties that other you know, it's, it, the, the human brain is part and parcel of the universe. It's a piece of, of furniture of the universe subject to the same laws of quantum mechanics and general relativity as everything else. So the, in that sense, there's nothing supernatural. Uh, it is true, IIT has no natural limit on phi. Phi can be big. In fact, we might be able to artificially enhance and, and enlarge our, uh, our, our, our brain by connecting to brains. So just like, you know, we know that if I take a normal brain and I cut it in two, to prevent epileptic seizures from spreading from one cortical hemisphere into the other one, it's called a split brain procedure. I can do the inverse. I can take two brains and say your brain and my brain, and with a future yet to be invented technology, I call brain bridging, where we directly connect my, my neurons, my cortical neurons with your cortical neurons, sort of like an artificial corpus callosum. We would then, according to the theory, if we add more and more wires, at some point we would abruptly get a new conscious a new conscious entity that would have aspect of your brain and your and my brain. It would be some sort of amalgamation of Gabriel and Christoph. It would control, you know, four two mouths and it would, you know, have four arms and four legs. And its phi would presumably considerably higher than the phi of either you or I. Brain like, bridging. Try it. We should try it as soon as we can. <laughs> 
There's like, like the, first able to do it in mice. <laughs> Like, like the creatures in, in Flatland uh, who cannot imagine uh, other dimensions, uh, I, I find it hard to even conceive what it would mean to have um, uh, a higher phi. Uh, imagine either by merging two brains or by some sort of um, uh, device that you can implant in your brain or, or by training or any other mechanism, imagine that you can uh, duplicate phi. What, what, does, what, what, what would that mean? What would that uh, feel like? Uh, what would be the feeling of life itself be with a, high, a higher fire? Well, I mean, just cast your mind back when you were, uh, before let's say you knew about sex or before the first time you fell in love, right? There's this entire new universe, A, when you, when you discover sexuality and you, you find and express your own sexuality, you now become sort of more conscious, right? You become conscious of whoever attracts you, and that gives rise to a, to a universe of conscious states. You fall in love, right? right? It's a profound new conscious state that, you know, presumably seven or eight or nine or 10 year olds, you didn't have. The first time you drank alcohol, the first time you tried, if you ever did, psilocybin or 5-MeO or any other drug, the first time you drank wine, right? So these are all, from our own experiences, we know to a certain extent what it means to have new conscious experiences. And so likewise, you just extrapolate that, you know, to a merged brain when we have new states accessible that neither your brain or I, my brain by itself will, will, will be conscious of. It won't be dramatic different because you're still a human brain and I'm still a human brain, um, but, but it, uh, there will be new states that we cannot have experienced before. Can I, can I switch gears now to, to a more personal level? You, you end the book on a um, passionate, uh, passionate argument uh, about how studying consciousness how, um, has uh, changed uh, aspects of uh, your life or how you see the world or, or how we as humans uh, interact with the world in general. Uh, what, what do you think are the implications of um, uh, getting further and further uh, into the mechanisms of consciousness uh, for, for, for you, for society, for our lives? Well, A, that you realize how very precious it is, how we would be nothing to ourselves if we wouldn't be conscious. Without consciousness, we don't exist for ourselves, right? If I'm a perfect zombie that moves around the world, that looks and behaves like me and does everything, if you give me a billion dollars, but I, but I say, I'm going to take away your experience, well, what's the point? Then, you know, I, I'm no one to myself. I don't exist. I may as well not exist for myself. So you just realize the preciousness of experience and how it is unique above anything else. And also you realize, particularly when you study consciousness in other animals, be that closely related species like dogs or be that more distant like an octopus, that consciousness and, and the pains and pleasures of life, you know, they're widespread and we should respect them even in insects. So, you know, since I had this sort of conversion to a more broader view of consciousness. I, I don't eat uh, flesh of, of animals anymore. I don't even kill insects anymore because they too have this brief moment, you know, book ended between two eternity, this brief moment when they can exist uh, and when they have feelings. And so once again, it makes life all the more precious. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, that's, uh, that, that, that's quite, uh, quite, quite beautiful. Um, Again, uh, uh, sort of a, on, a, on a personal level, um, the question of consciousness uh, has always elicited very strong reactions uh, from scientists, philosophers, many people who have argued that, that we're not quite ready to tackle this question. Many, many people who have argued that these questions are unanswerable. How do you, um, how, how do you have the courage to, to, to drive the field forward? How do you uh, uh, manage uh, uh, in the midst of uh, so many different opinions and skepticism and uh, and other ways of thinking about the problem. Well, you disregard much of that. Of course, it's self-fulfilling prophecy. If you say we can never tackle it, then of course, by definition, we'll never solve it. So, you know, we have to, we have to do the best we can. Yes, maybe I'm deluding myself in this theory, this idea I'm pursuing won't be the correct final theory, but the, but the most important thing, it makes very specific predictions. We now engaged in, in this adversarial collaboration. In fact, you, Gabriel, of course, are part of that, where we test prediction of the two dominant theories of consciousness, the dominant scientific theories, integrated information theory and global neuronal workspace. 
And so again, in, in that sort of clash of ideas and specific experiment, even if both theories will shown to be very imperfect approximation, that's progress, right? And on this, on this, on this ancient 2,400 year old, at least old problem, we can make progress. So for instance, IT has already now provided progress. There's now a procedure that's used in, in, in several hundred patients already that's being tested in many clinics called Zap and Zip to actually test whether this patient who's unresponsive, right, who I, don't, I cannot communicate with because her, her brain is so damaged due to traffic accident and whatever, I can now test Using, using this calculus, whether the patient, whether somebody home there or not. So that shows that real progress is possible despite, despite the doomsayers and despite many people saying, well, it's, it's philosophy. Of course, it's philosophy. It's one of the oldest forms of philosophy, but all scientific problems started off as philosophy early on. And then as we developed powerful tools and theories, we took them from philosophy and turned them into empirical science. Very good. Um, I'm going to turn it now to the audience. There's a there's a lot of questions in the in, in the Q and A, uh, so I'm going to read some of the questions. There there are two people here, uh, uh, Swami and Glenn, that are asking about where do you stand on the hard problem of consciousness? Is the hard problem of consciousness uh, answerable? Well, once again, I mean, you know, if you believe the hard problem of David Chalmers that it is forever hard, then of course you, you're never going to try to solve it. So I, once again, I find that a defeatist uh, argument. Many philosophers over the last hundred years have made often the argument that certain problems can never be solved, will never be accessible to human insight. Like for example, August Kant in the 19th century, the father of positivism made this assertion, we shall never know what stars are made out of. Today, he probably would have said, well, that's a hard problem with a capital H. Well, it turned out 20 years later, they invented this spectroscope, spe uh, spectrogram, and you could analyze the constituents in the atmosphere of our own sun by looking at the, at the spectral decomposition. So yes, these problems are difficult, but are they forever hard? We don't know. Human ingenuity is very powerful. So let's trust our good old ingenuity to solve these problems. Let's not be taken in too much. I agree, I agree, absolutely. Uh, David Ryson uh, asks about uh, the functions of dreams and I assume the relationship between dreams and consciousness. Dreams, so the function of dreams, you know, there are many hypotheses about it. You know, Francis Crick, of course, had the famous one. It's, it's, uh, it's used to more efficiently reorganize our memories. We don't, still don't know what the function of dreams is, if it has one. But certainly dreaming is one part of consciousness. It is conscious, you're, you're co highly conscious of it. You see and hear. In fact, inside the dream, you cannot typically distinguish the dream from reality, right? Most people, except if you have a lucid dream, you don't know that you're in a dream. And you're not surprised that you can walk through walls or fly or meet you know, a long lost pet or a long lost uh, loved one. So it's, it's, it's another manifestation of consciousness inside a sleeping body. So it makes it particularly interesting to study. Uh, I apologize to the audience if I don't get to all the questions or if I mispronounce your names. Peter Cariani asks, uh, how does Tononi's theory of requisite, oh, uh, of requisite informational complexity of accessible functional states relate to neural global workspace theories that requires closure via sustained regenerative uh, uh, recurrent activity and feedback. So it's the relationship between IIT and complexity and uh, Victor Lame, Bernard Bars, De Haen and global workspace theories. Okay, well, I, I, okay, there are four different theories. They all, so IIT is being tested right now in this, in this uh, international collaboration with uh, 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 10 different labs, Gabriel Kreiman here being one of them, where some of the prediction of IIT are contrasted against the prediction of global neuron workspace. It's very difficult right now because global neuron workspace makes very different assumptions about consciousness uh, than, than IIT and has different implications for computer consciousness. Right now, those can be tested, but what we can some of the neuronal implication. Global neuron workspace has consciousness, is, the footprint of consciousness is essentially in the front of the brain because it has to do with cognition with intelligence. IIT essentially says, no, it's in the back of the brain, the back of cortex where the connectivity is, is highest. So that's a big experience. 
that, that, that we're trying to test. The two theories also differ on how on, on the relationship between the, the, the timing of the footprint of consciousness and how long you're, you're conscious of something. Again, that's, that can be tested and that is being tested right now in this three year long effort. So we will know in two years or so, or three years maybe given COVID, we'll know more about uh, the status of G and, uh, GNW versus IIT. Changyan uh, Lingu, and again, I, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, consciousness is something confused with awareness and or attention by, by the general public. Are these terms related in some way or are they totally uh, separated conce uh, concepts? So consciousness, awareness, attention. Okay, it's a very good question. So I, some people distinguish between awareness and consciousness. I don't, I don't, I've never found any useful operational way. So for me, it's the same. I, it's, and I, I just notice sociologically, some, most people are more comfortable speaking about awareness, for example, in grand rather than consciousness. But, but, but scientifically, I, I don't distinguish. Attention and consciousness are very different. So, and we now know experimentally, there are probably 60, 70 different experiments where people have shown that you can attend to something, attention uh, visual in this case, but not be conscious of it, which sounds strange. Right. So attention means selective processing of information, selective in space, in time, or in some feature. You can do that without being conscious. So at least you can dissociate attention and conscious one way. Whether you can dissociate both ways, that in other words, can you be conscious of something without attending to it? That remains experimentally more difficult to address. And that's my, that remains much more controversial. But I think most psychologists would now agree that you can attend to things without necessarily becoming conscious of them. So in your book, you touch upon uh, meditation as well as uh, uh, states of consciousness uh, in devoid of any uh, external sensory experience. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, uh, are Krishna chanting or bhakti yoga is said to evolve one's uh, consciousness? So meditation, yoga, certain practices that are uh, purported to evolve consciousness. Uh, can I know your take on this? Yeah, so people, so, I don't know personally because I'm not a, a, a practitioner of, of, of these particular uh, meditative or uh, practices. Uh, people, so there are these what this class of experience called mystical experiences that you can get uh, in certain forms of, of, of meditation. And some people call it naked awareness or sheer awareness, um, pure awareness, it's called. Some people also report these doing uh, in an isolation tank, these mystical experiences. Of course, the, the world literature is full of them with respect to religious conversion experiences. They also have some of this character. Near death experiences sometimes have this character. And um, certain drugs, particularly the drugs of the serotonin class like psilo, uh, psilocybin, DMT and 5-MeO DMT can also lead to these mystical states so what's a mystical state? So from a phenomenological point of view, a mystical state is a state when time, two things totally disappear, the self and time. So typically, and I've been in these states, you're gone, your memory's gone, your thoughts are gone, the self is gone, your body is gone, there's no more Christoph, no more thoughts, no more dreams, no more desire, none of that is present, they're timeless, they're not too short, they're not too long, there's no flow of time. So the sense of self is completely gone. The sense of time is, is totally gone. Sometimes the, the sense of space can be gone. And typically you don't hear, you don't see, you don't have fear, you don't have pain, you don't have pleasure. Uh, typically they're associated with very powerful emotional states, either ecstasy or dread or a curious combination. So in, in some of my mystical experiences, you have this combination of of awfulness, sort of you, the awfulness of pure experience, the ecstasy and the terror of, of being confronted with this, what feels like a pure thing. And there's no more you there. It's a, it's a very peculiar state. It's very, very compelling. But I think ultimately it is a product of the brain. I'm not sure whether I would call it higher consciousness. It's a very rarely encountered form of consciousness. I'm not sure in, in, to what extent it is the higher form of consciousness. 
you just alluded to uh, memory. Um, Javier Macis asks, does consciousness require a capacity for memory, at least short-term memory? Uh, probably yes. Although IET doesn't say, the theory doesn't say anything specific about memory. Certainly for human level, it's very difficult to imagine being conscious without at least having very short, uh, short-term memory. And I know no patient that doesn't have, uh, of course, there are plenty of patients who've lost long-term memory, yet are still conscious, like, you know, people with, the, with dementia, they're, they're, they're clearly conscious, but don't even know who they are anymore. It's very difficult to imagine what would it be like to have to not even have this short-term form of consciousness. In principle, though, it may be possible. Uh, with several others, uh, Kirill Sinkel asks whether there is a function uh, to consciousness. And, and I know in the book you talk about um, uh, the evolution of consciousness as well. Yeah, so that's a very, very good one. Because we have to ask, I mean, we clearly are highly conscious and I can be, you know, as you get older, you can be conscious of your internal states and it's highly differentiated. So clearly this couldn't have arisen by chance. So what is the function of, um, of consciousness? Uh, and there have been many, many functions that have been proposed, including by myself and Francis Crick. So for instance, to make a, a, my particular idea is an executive hypothesis. I live in a in a very complex environment, if I want to quickly summarize what goes on and make that summary available to my planning stages, like an executive summary, that could be one function. Biology, it's very, it's very often very difficult to answer the function. What's the, what's the function of one leg or what one eye or of one gene? Those are very difficult to answer. And the way to the way I think about consciousness and evolution is per IIT. Consciousness by itself doesn't have a function. It's just its internal causal power. Just like no physicist would say, well, what's the function of electric charge or what's the function of gravity? Gravity is just, you know, space, it's curvature in space time. Electric charge is just the propensity of things to attract or to repel each other. Now, biological organism can exploit electric charge, right? For example, to separate charges inside and outside the neuron and you get a neuronal uh, you get a membrane potential and an action potential, but, but primarily it doesn't have a function. Behavior, uh, evolution selects for behavior, right? E evolution ultimately selects whether I'm going to survive or not, not what I feel inside. So it's, 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 from the point of view of evolution, you could argue that consciousness directly is like a, a, what, what Dawkins or, or Wilson at Harvard calls a spandrel. It's not directly selected for. What's directly selected for by evolution is, is behavior. But indirectly, you can show this very nice in computer simulation. When you have creatures that you evolve in artificial environments, the creatures do better to the extent they take all their sensors and integrate them and make all that integrated information available to their processor. Right? Their, 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 their sound and their sight, their camera and everything go, goes into the central processor to, to make that information available to planning. And you can measure in these simulated creatures that they also have high fi. So you would expect evolutionary that, syst that, uh, that uh, systems evolve that have high adaptability and high intelligence also have high fi, which is why intelligence and I think fi correlate in evolved creatures. But in engineered system, like on the one hand brain organoids, on the other hand, artificial you know, supercomputers, I think you can separate that and you can build systems that have high intelligence and no consciousness, or that may even have high consciousness, but no intelligence. So uh, an anonymous attendee asks uh, whether you think it's ethical to induce consciousness in machines. So you talked a little bit about um, the fact that uh, today's machines don't, don't quite have it per, per IIT, uh, but what, what if future machines uh, built on different hardware could, could actually um, uh, have uh, hi-fi and therefore, according to a theory, consciousness. Uh, do you foresee any ethical problems with uh, building machines that are sentient? Well, I mean, you know, you can look at Black Mirror, you can look at Westworld, you know, there will be untold, you know, it's a complex world and you can imagine all sorts of nasty scenarios where you build something that only experiences pain that's in fact only capable of experience pain. And that would be of course atrocious 
to put such a creature into, into the world. You can also imagine that you can build creatures that only experience pleasure, or more likely if these uh, creatures actually have to survive out there that have like us, that can experience both pain and pleasure. And then I think the moral imperative is to enable them to live in a universe where they maximize uh, you know, the, 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 the pleasure or, or they maximize their own capability to experience and you minimize uh, the pain. But in practice, there will always be scenarios where this doesn't happen or where you get these conflicts, as you can see in Watching Westworld episode. Uh, if it's okay with you, uh, uh, Christoph, uh, we'll take a few more questions. Uh, uh, is, is, is that okay? Um, yeah. Uh, Murtasa uh, asks, uh, is intentionality a property of consciousness? Is, um, I assume this is talking about uh, the relationship between consciousness and, and volition and free will and intentionality. Are these uh, uh, things related? Well, uh, yeah. So consciousness always has content. It's always about something, right? So it's about my toothache or it's about, you know, seeing, seeing Gabriel here on the screen. As I said, it may be possible in a state of pure consciousness when there is no more content. And then the question is, then there isn't really any in intentionality anymore because it's, it's not about anything. In, if, if it's really true that you can truly obtain a state of pure consciousness with no content whatsoever. Free will is a totally separate question. So according um, A, having will, uh, having the, the feeling of will, of agency, you know, I'm now, raising my left hand and now I'm raising my right hand that goes hand in hand with uh, ownership. I know it's my hand. It's not Gabriel's hand and it goes hand with a feeling of intentionality. I wanted to raise my right hand or I wanted to raise my left hand and, and the feeling of wanting to do it as compared to when you put a sunscreen and magnetic stimulation on my head and trigger it, then I feel my hands flip. But I know it's not me that triggered that. And, and that's a very different feeling. So these are all conscious feelings that, that, that go hand in hand with consciousness. IIT says uh, wi uh, will, what people call will, essentially is the maximum of causal power. The maximum of intrinsic causal power, that's it, what you experience as this feeling of agency that we all have. Uh, the, the maximal causal power is also uh, important to understand in terms of uh, Two other questions that are here that I'm going to um, uh, put together. Uh, one question relates to uh, what do you think about Marvin Minsky's society of mind? And the other question relates to uh, consciousness at different levels. For example, is there, does a society uh, as a whole uh, have, uh, have consciousness? Okay, so that relates to the general question, the, the meriological question of the relationship between the parts and the whole. So IIT says, it's only the maximum for any particular substrate that's conscious. So right now, Gabriel is conscious, I'm conscious. We interact, so clearly there's some sort of amount of interaction among the two of us. But, that in, but if we compute the integrated information across both Gabriel's and my brains, it's minuscule. So there isn't any entity that exists that is Gabriel and, and, um, and Christoph. Likewise, if I extend this over all 310 million Americans, that it's a tiny max, it's a tiny number, vastly less than the number inside my head or the head of any other American. Therefore, America does not exist as an intrinsic, uh, as a maximum of causal effect power. Therefore, the, it doesn't, there isn't anything like it to be America as a conscious entity. Although America, of course, has external causal powers. It can start wars, etc., but it doesn't have any intrinsic causal power. So it's, it's really only the maximum. So likewise, the neurons in my head, the individual neurons are unconscious. It's really the collective, the maximum of, of whatever in, my, in the footprint in my brain that's constituted by the maximum. Um, at that level of resolution is what's conscious, not the individual neurons, not the individual uh, atoms that make part of it. And that's true whether you're dealing with society or with brains or with subcomponents of brain. It's always only the maximum. Very good. So uh, there's a question here. Uh, maybe I'll take one more question if that's okay with you, Christoph. I know we're running uh, a little bit after six uh, uh, in Boston. Um, th th there are two questions here by Sechen Sang. Does current research in learning theory from both neuroscience and machine learning community help us in any way to understand consciousness? 
It helps us practically for sure. So, you know, uh, at the Institute I run here, the Allen Institute for Brain Science, you know, we, ha we use all sorts of advanced machine learning, deep interpolation, other advanced machine learning techniques to help us make sense of the data. Will it help us conceptually to understand it? I don't know at this point. I can't answer that. I haven't seen that directly, but I don't exclude it. All right. Very good. Thank you very much, Christoph. Uh, this, uh, this was uh, really uh, wonderful. Uh, I'm glad that you're surviving the windstorm and that you managed to connect with us. And yeah, uh, okay. it, uh, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you about uh, the feeling of life itself, uh, uh, which I, I, I truly enjoyed. So thanks a lot. Kate. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Kate, for hosting us. I was going to say, if you have time and you'd like to, you're more than welcome to go 10 minutes over because I know that we started late. But if you have somewhere to go, no problem. Yeah, I have my next uh, Zoom call coming up. <laughs> Good luck. Oh. Well, I'm glad we managed to fix the, I mean, it's just as you said, if there are te technical problems, we'll try to fix it. Boom, my internet blanked out for five minutes. Yeah, and I cursed us by saying it might happen in my introduction. Yes, you <laughs> I saw you us. Yes. You jinked it. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, thank you again to both of you for, for your time and for your patience and for that lovely event. And thank you to everyone out there for spending your evening with us. Uh, please feel free to learn more about the book and purchase The Feeling of Life Itself on harvard.com. So on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, all in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a good night. Please keep reading and please be well. Thank you. Thank you very Ciao. much. Bye-bye. Thank Bye, you. Bye, Gabriel.